happen to come to practice the Dharma. There are a lot of times when you experience culture shock. And it's not a question of going from a Western culture to an Asian culture. It's going from the culture of ordinary people with defilements to the culture of the noble ones. There's a different set of values, there's a different etiquette, and there's a different purpose. The culture of ordinary people is just to keep families going, to keep the human race surviving, keep people clothed and fed, and try to sort out, find a balance to different people's greed and anger and delusion. To balance out their greed and anger and delusion in such a way that things are relatively peaceful. But it's always within the context of what's possible in a world where when you have gain, you have to have loss. When you have status, you have to have loss of status. Praise and criticism, pleasure and pain. These things all come in pairs. So you don't get anything that's totally whole. Well, the purpose of the customs of the noble ones is to lead to something that, as one Forrester John said, is one single thing all the way through. There's no concern about keeping the human race going or keeping your appetites going. But it, there is a main concern with finding a true happiness. That, that one point, that one focus trumps everything else. And it affects everything within the culture, from the way we walk, the way we talk, what we wear, what we eat, the kind of shelter we look for, the medicine we use, everything from the very basics all the way up to how we comprehend our own minds. And so as you shift from one culture to the next, there are bound to be periods of culture shock. But you have to keep reminding yourself that the purpose of all this is to take seriously that deep desire that everyone has for true happiness. I mean, think about it. The Buddha was a very demanding person. He wanted nothing less than absolute happiness, a happiness that was one single thing all the way through. It wasn't, didn't have other things nibbling away at the edges. So even though he had wealth, status, all what, what they call the good things of the world, they weren't good enough for him. And so his totally motivating factor was the desire for true happiness. Happiness with no drawbacks. In other words, it wasn't going to cause suffering for other people either. It would have to be a happiness that was built on developing his inner resources. He didn't have to take anything away from anyone else. He lived off what people offered him as a way of making that happiness more pure. And also realizing that the happiness was not going to come from owning things or having things, so he's going to have to teach his mind to be more self-reliant. And by developing that self-reliance, he found that there was a lot more to the mind than he would have originally expected. So as we come to the Dharma, try to keep that same purpose in mind. A true happiness that doesn't have to depend on anything. And of course, the culture shock that comes up is when your ordinary old desires are thwarted, your old habits. Screaming for attention sometimes. But you have to look exactly where are they going to take you. They take you back to that world of opposites. That world, the world where there's nothing in a really pure form. And when you're being realistic about your desires, it's simply learning to put up with second best. There was an article recently in Tricycle where a psychologist was arguing that the Buddhist attitude towards craving is that craving is, or desire is really a problem only if you want the objects of your craving to be total, to be there with you forever. As long as you're realistic and realize that nothing lasts forever, then desire is no problem. That's his idea of being realistic. And of course, it has nothing to do with what the Buddha taught. As the Buddha taught, it's not so much that we cling at the objects of our desire, we cling at the desire itself. We crave desire itself. It's something we enjoy. And if desire without latching on to an expectation of permanent objects for the desire were okay, then why are there so much trouble from 
sexual predators or warmongers who don't really care to hold on to their conquest, but want to keep going on for more and more and more. They like the process. They like the thrill of the chase. And this is what's a real problem with human desire. It wrecks the world and also wrecks the mind. So what we're learning to do is find something that puts the mind in a state where it doesn't really have to desire anything anymore. Part of it comes from learning to temper your desires, but it also means refocusing them. Instead of having scattered desires for all kinds of stuff, you focus it on one big desire, desire for total freedom. Now, what's radical about the Buddhist teachings is that that desire is realistic, too. Total freedom, ultimate happiness. Because after all, isn't that we, why we desire things? We hope that they're going to give us happiness, and that tends up, they end up not giving. Psychologists have done studies that show that people are very unrealistic about the amount of happiness they're going to get out of things, relationships, advancement at work. It's painted in all kinds of beautiful colors. And then when these things actually come, the colors fade. That sets you up for wanting something else and keep going in that direction, and there's no end to it. But even though we've been disappointed before, even though we've seen the colors fade right before our eyes, we start imagining, well, the next one, the next person, the next thing, the next position in life. That'll have the colors that'll be color fast. But it doesn't work out that way. It's like the old story of the person eating peppers and crying because the peppers were hot. And the people said, why do you keep on eating them? He said, well, I hope to find there's going to be a sweet one in here someplace. That's the way most people are about their happiness. What well, the Buddha is saying that when you, you know, pursue awakening, when you pursue nirvana, it's not going to lead to a disappointment. Quite the contrary. It goes well beyond your expectations, well beyond your hopes. Even just the first taste of the deathless stream entry is enough to produce a seismic shift in your whole awareness, your whole understanding of what you think you are and what's possible in life and the importance of your own actions. Once you reach that state, then your, your conviction in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha is unshakable. And your standards for what counts as true happiness get ratcheted up quite a ways. But in the meantime, until you get that, reach that stage, you're going to have a shakeable conviction. That's part of the game. It's only to be expected, because you haven't seen the results really turn into something earth shaking yet. So this is why you have to work at your own sense of conviction. It's your drive that's going to see you through all the hurdles that are going to be placed in your way. It's your conviction that there is a way out that's going to help find that way out. It's like someone lost in the forest. If you're, if you're not really convinced that there's a way out, you give up very easily. You run into an obstacle here, an obstacle there, and it just seems way too much, and it stops you. But if you're convinced that there's got to be a way out, you've heard of other people who've made their way out. It's got to be in here someplace. You find yourself, you keep looking, looking, looking. And then you say how the other people before you did it. You say, oh, that was the path they took. So it's conviction plays a, an important role in the, in the path. The Buddha cites it as one of is the first strength of mind that leads to awakening. It's conviction in the Buddha's awakening and conviction in the principle of karma. He was a human being. He did it through his own actions. You're a human being. You can do it through yours. And this also means having that kind of single-minded focus, a single-minded respect for your desire, for a really single, totally unadulterated happiness. It doesn't have little things nibbling away at the edges. It doesn't have other stains mixed in. It's something total. It's deep down inside, that's what we all what we all want. Part of us doesn't believe it's real. We've been taught so much. This culture that we're trying to leave has been teaching us all along that 
Total happiness is not possible. Content yourself with what we have to offer. We have nice jobs. We have nice cars. We have nice families. If you don't like a family, you can have an affair. All the legal and illegal pleasures that worldly cultures promise. And they teach you to settle for these things. And people have been settling for them for how many lifetimes? But the Buddha asks you, don't settle for that. Aim higher. Aim at what the heart's true desire is. Unmitigated happiness, total freedom. Because it's here that effort is well spent. The Buddha saw that our experience of the world, these four dimensions of space and time, depends on our own karmic import. There's an effort that has to be made to keep it going, keep it going, keep it going. And the question is, is it worth it? If you look at the world of conditioned things, they're not really. If that, those are your goals, they're not worth it at all because they just come and they go. But the Buddha realized that conditioned things are also conditioning things. In other words, these fabricated things, if you learn how to use them skillfully, lead someplace. Even if you learn how to, don't know how to use them skillfully, they they lead various places. But the question is, do you really want to go there? But he says, if you take the effort to get skillful at these things, they can lead you to a happiness that is worthwhile. That can be taken as a goal in and of itself. So we're living in the same world of conditioned things, but we're approaching them in a different way. And this is what the difference in the, that culture of the noble ones provides. A delight in developing the skill, a delight in abandoning unskillful things, abandoning your old attitudes, abandoning your idea that you can find a happiness and, or take find a happiness and that you can take as your goal among conditioned things. That's what you work at abandoning. And you work at developing, one, the conviction that there is a release. As the Buddha saw, the laws of causality are such that, as in chaos there, there are these points of resonance where you use the laws of your causal experience to take you to an opening that takes you out of the system entirely. That's possible. That effort, he says, is worth it. And it's up to us. We, the Buddha says this opportunity is here. We have this human life. What are we going to do with it? Are we going to explore that possibility? Or are we going to test it to see if what he's saying is true? The nature of what he promises is really inviting. And it seems a shame that people don't take him up on that challenge. But we don't have to worry about other people. It's a decision that each of us has to make for ourselves, each of us for himself alone. But you find that if you stick with that desire, stick with that conviction, the results really are greater than anything you can imagine.